All right, now we're getting into the part of the chapter. This section is going to feel like a bit of a diversion from what we've been working on. We'll see in the next section or two how it's related to what we've been doing. But for now, um, I would say the theme going forward in this chapter is that calculus is easy if you stick to polynomials, right? If the only thing I have to worry about is the power rule, then de derivatives and integrals are easy. Um, so our goal in this chapter is to write functions like sine or cosine or e to the x or ln x or anything. Just write them like polynomials. Um, and you'll be surprised that that is actually kind of kind of possible to do. So first what we do is we say, okay, let's figure out what degree polynomial we want to use. And we could really pick anything we want. I'm going to start us off with just saying, let's find a first degree polynomial, like a linear function, to represent or to model the function e to the x. And I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but e to the x isn't linear. And you know what? You're absolutely right. We're going to make our approximations better and better. So bear with me for now. Um, in order to make a function um, that, that a, a polynomial, um, to model a given function, what we do is we make sure we pick a value and we say that we're centering our polynomial at that value. For right now, we're going to pick zero at x equals zero. We're, we say that we're centering it at x equals zero. So what we do is we make sure that the function agrees at zero, right? So f of zero is our polynomial evaluated at zero, and that the first derivative agrees at zero too. Um, what we'll eventually do for higher degree polynomials is just make sure that all the derivatives agree at the value that we've chosen. So um, our function here is e to the x. So there's our f of x. And we'll just note that f of 0 is e to the 0, which is 1. So we're going to make our first degree polynomial. That looks like this, right? That's a but that's what a first degree polynomial looks like. And if f of 0 is equal to 1, that means that we want p1 of 0 to equal to equal 1. And we'll just note that p1 of 0 is what I get when I plug in 0 for x into this polynomial up here. So it's a1 times 0 plus a0. So p1 of 0 is just a0. And that means a0 has to equal 1. Now, so that's what we get from, from making them the functions agree at 0. Um, now what we got to do is um, make the derivatives agree at 0. So we'll note that f prime of x, you know, f of x is e to the x, its derivative is e to the x. So f prime of 0 is e to the 0, still 1. And if we take a look at our polynomial up here, p, uh, p prime, p1 prime of x, that's a1, is the constant a1. So we need the derivative to agree at 0. So we want p1 prime of 0 to equal f prime of 0, which means we need a1 to equal 1. So now I know a1, and I know a0, and that means I know my first degree polynomial. p1 of x is equal to x plus 1. Now let's take a look at the graphs here. So in blue, I'm going to graph e to the x. And then in red, I'm going to graph our linear function x plus 1. Whoops. Let me change. There we go. OK. So uh, Looks like they're pretty close to each other, right around x equals 0. In fact, I'm going to zoom in on that. I'm going to change my window to, say, minus 2 to 2. 
maybe on all both the X and the Y. Let's see what that looks like. Alright. I'm going to make one more adjustment. I'm going to let Y go from minus 1 to 4 or something like that. Okay. So we can see it's pretty close right there, and then it doesn't take too long for it to really stray away from the exponential function. Um, fair enough. All right. What if we want to do better? Hopefully we want to do better than that. So the way we do better is we insist that higher derivatives agree. And the only way to make that happen is to have a higher degree polynomial. So let's say we want to get a second degree polynomial that looks like Here's what a second degree polynomial looks like. Um, and I want to center it again at x equals 0 for the same function, right? So I want the function. I want f of 0 to equal p2 of 0. I want f prime of 0 to equal p2 prime of 0. And I want f double prime of 0 to equal p2 double prime of 0. So in order to have the functions just agree, right, in order for this to be true, we're going to need to have a naught equals 1 again. Um, and that's because if you plug in x equals 0 into this arbitrary, uh, you know, second degree, gen generic second degree uh, polynomial, then the first two terms drop out and you just have a naught, right? So that means p2 of 0 is equal to a naught, and we need that to equal f of 0, which we know is equal to 1, it's e to the 0. Um, so that means now what we're working with is uh, is this function here. So we know that that a naught is equal to one. So now let's um, let's work with the information we get from derivatives. So I'm just on the side here. I'm just going to note that you know f of x is equal to e to the x f of 0 is 1, f prime of x is e to the x, so f prime of 0 is equal to 1, f double prime of x is still e to the x, so f double prime of 0 is equal to 1, right? e to the x is stable under differentiation, so all of those values there are going to be equal to 1 when it, at, um, at 0. Now I'm going to work with these derivatives. So p2 prime of x taking that derivative, just using the power rule here. So I get 2a2x plus a1. And that means that if I plug in 0, p2 prime of 0, that's equal to a1. And that has to equal 1. That's by design. That's what we need to have be true. I needed that to agree with the derivative um, of, of f of x. And the second derivative, I take the derivative again, this is just 2a2, and so p2 double prime of 0 is equal to 2a2, and I need that to equal the second derivative. So that has to equal 1, and that means that a2 is equal to a half. So now I know a0, I know a1, I know a2, so I've got my second degree polynomial. p2 of x is 1 half x squared plus x plus 1. Notice that our second degree polynomial contains the first degree polynomial, right? It contains the last one when we said let's find a degree 1 polynomial, we got x plus 1. That's always going to be true. So if you found the first few terms, you don't have to find them over again, all right? Uh, so going forward, if I've already found degree 2 polynomial and I want a degree 3 polynomial, that means I only have one more term to find. I just need to use those third derivatives. So we've got our polynomial. Let's see if this does any better at approximating e to the x for a longer period of time. This one will be in pink. 1 half x squared plus x plus 1. And it does, in fact, do a better job. It hugs it tighter, you know, closer for a bit longer. It'll still stray. And in fact, if you uh, zoom out, it 
it gets pretty far away, the bigger X is. But it did stay closer for a longer period of time. If we wanted a degree 3 polynomial, we could just insist that the third derivatives uh, agree. Um, and if you do that, you'll get this polynomial here, 1 third X cubed, and then you'll notice it kind of brought all the, the second degree polynomial with it, right? Just one additional term, that 1 third, X, or sorry, 1 over 6 uh, X cubed, uh, third uh, degree 3 term. So this process has a name. We're say that we say that we're finding a Taylor polynomial, or in this case, a Maclaurin polynomial when we center it at zero. I could choose to center a function anywhere, and if I chose to center it some at some arbitrary value c, instead of having powers of x, we have powers of x minus c, and we write it out that way rather than say expanding the x minus c squared or x minus c cubed. Um, it makes m much more sense, and you'll see it'll end up being a lot easier to, to deal with when we write it this way. Also easier to find. And there is a pattern to how we find the coefficients, right? How we get these values, right, those coefficients on the powers of x minus c, and they're just given by making sure that the function agrees, that the first derivative agrees, this, this here is what happens when we make the second derivative agree. We have these, um, you know, we have that n factorial in the bottom because of what happens when we keep taking derivatives using the power rule. We keep bringing down the next power, and so you end up with, you know, times, like if I find, um, like if I were to go up here and say, I want a p3 of x, and I know that's going to be a3 x cubed, Plus, and then I and then I already know it's going to involve these guys. So plus one half x squared plus x plus one. So I find derivatives. The first derivative is three times a three x squared plus uh, what x plus one, and then p three double prime. Take the next derivative. That's three times. I have to bring that one down. So times two times a three x plus one and then take the another derivative p double, triple prime and and you know usually if it's to the first power we don't say we're using the power rule but but uh, we can right so I bring you know three times two times one times a cubed times x to the zero which is one so we can sort of see how the n factorial appears and in order to make those um, agree I had to in this case, divide by that, right? That had to agree with what the second derivative was, so I had to divide by this n factorial, in this case, 2 factorial, to get that coefficient to be 1 half. Um, and that's just generalized here. So you take your nth derivative, evaluate it at c, and divide it by n factorial, and that is the coefficient on the nth term. So here's just how we define the nth Taylor and Maclaurin polynomial. So the Taylor polynomial is just um, the polynomial of degree n centered at c, and it has powers of x minus c, and, and our coefficients are uh, obtained just by how we were talking about. Um, if we center it at zero, we give it the special name. We call it a Maclaurin polynomial. They're really the same thing. A Maclaurin polynomial has to be centered at zero. If somebody says find a Maclaurin polynomial and they don't say where it's centered, we just have to understand that means that it has to be centered at zero. And using this pattern, we could see that the nth Maclaurin polynomial for e to the x would look like this, right? 1 plus x plus 1 half x squared, 1 over n cubed, 1 over, uh, sorry, 1 over th uh, 1 over 3 factorial x cubed, 1 over 4 factorial x to the 4th, 1 over 5 factorial x to the 5th, and so on. And in fact, it might even be interesting right here. Um, I'm going to go in, I'm going to turn off, I'm going to clear these ones. And I think I'm just going to put in the 5th degree uh, Maclaurin polynomial. So 1 plus x plus 1 half uh, x squared plus 1 over 3 factorial, that's 1 over 6 times x cubed 
plus 1 over 4 factorial is 24 plus 1 over 5 factorial, that's 1 over 120 times x to the fifth. All right, so there's the fifth degree polynomial. I'm going to um, make the window a little bigger, say from minus 5 to 5, and from minus 1 to 10. We'll see what that looks like first. There's e to the x, and there's the fifth degree Maclaurin polynomial. So we can see, like over here on the left, right, it'll it diverges um, and keeps diverging. That really hugs the function quite close. I'm going to um, change the window, adjust the window a little bit more. Maybe I'll only go out to four on x, and I'm going to make it go up to twenty on y. Yeah, like that hugs it really tight. So even with just five terms, um, that polynomial is a pretty good approximation of e to the x for a pretty large window. All right, next we're going to find Taylor polynomials for the function ln of x centered at 1. Now we can't. We should. We should be noted. We cannot center this polynomial at zero because ln of zero is undefined. Um, so we're going to center it at uh, at c equals one. So we're going to have powers of x minus one. Um, and it looks like we're going to find all the polynomials up to p four. So really, that sets out the work we need to do. We need to find the derivatives up to the fourth derivative. And evaluate each at one. And that's going to help us find our coefficients. So let's begin. f of x is ln x and f of one is ln of 1, which is 0. And by the way, since I, I, that's, the, that's what the function is, evaluated at 0, that means that p0, the constant function that approximates this, is 0. It's not a very good approximation. It only agrees at, at that value, and then it diverges quite quickly. All right, f prime of x, that's 1 over x. So f prime of 1 is 1 over 1, or 1. Um, now 1 over x is x to the minus 1, and I'm writing it that way because i got to keep taking derivatives, and I'm going to use the power rule. So negative x to the negative 2. And for evaluating, I'm going to put it back in a fraction form, so negative 1 over x squared. And if I evaluate that at 1, I get negative 1. The third derivative is what, 2x to the negative 3, or 2 over x cubed. And if I evaluate that at 1, we get 2. And the fourth derivative would be negative 6x to the negative 4, or negative 6 over x to the fourth. And if we evaluate the fourth derivative at 1, we get uh, negative 6. So now um, we have our p0. Let's, let's, uh, let's continue. Let's find p1. So p1 of x, that's f of 1 plus f prime of 1 times x minus 1 to the first. So that's 0 plus 1, f prime of 1 is 1, times x minus 1. And if we simplify that, p1 of x is just x minus 1. p2 of x is going to be p1 of x plus another term, plus the second degree term. 
That second degree term is f double prime of 1 over 2 factorial times x minus 1 squared. So that's x minus 1 plus f double prime is negative 1 over 2 factorial times x minus 1 squared, um, which we can clean up a little bit. P2 of x is x minus 1 minus 1 half x minus 1 squared. All right, p3 of x. We are going to take our p2 of x and add one more term, which is, whoops, which is the third derivative over 3 factorial times x minus 1 cubed. This is x minus 1 minus a half x minus 1 squared plus, and then let's see, the third derivative is 2 over 3 factorial x minus 1 cubed. And 2 over 3 factorial is 1 over 3. We can cancel that factor of 2. All right, and now the last one, p4 of x. I'm just going to take what I've already got for p3 of x, add our fourth term. So the fourth derivative uh, evaluated at 1 over 4 factorial times x minus 1 to the fourth. Um, the fourth derivative, that's negative 6 over 4 factorial, x minus 1 to the fourth. Um, now, 4 factorial is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. So um, the 2 times 3 will actually cancel with the factor 2 times 3 that we have up top. So we'll be left with 1 fourth or a negative 1 fourth. And there's our uh, fourth degree Taylor polynomial. Um, at this point, if you just sort of observe what we're looking at here, you might be able to make a good guess about what the fifth uh, Taylor polynomial would look like, centered at 1. Um, all right, now let's move on. Let's do another one. We're going to find the sixth McLaurin polynomial for the function cosine x. So it's a McLaurin polynomial. That means c is equal to 0. I'm going to start, and it's a 6 polynomial, so I'm going to find up to the 6th derivative. So f of x is cosine x, f prime is negative sine x. f double prime is negative cosine x. The third derivative is positive sine x. The fourth derivative is cosine x. At this point, I mean, there's two more to find, I guess, but we don't have to keep going because I've, I've returned to the original function, so I know that that cycle is going to just repeat itself. The next one will be negative sine, the next one after that will be negative cosine. Uh, if we start evaluating, f of 0 is cosine of 0, which is 1. f prime of 0 is negative sine of 0, and that's 0. The second derivative is minus cosine 0, which is negative 1. The third derivative is sine 0, which is 0. Um, and then we're back to the fourth derivative, right? Or the fourth derivative is back to the original. 
So like this pattern here, that four number pattern there, that repeats. So I know that the fifth derivative is zero. I know the sixth derivative is negative one. I think we're ready to start. I'm going to begin just by writing out the form that this takes on, right? Like what the, in general, what the nth McLaurin polynomial looks like, or what the sixth McLaurin polynomial looks like is f of zero plus f prime of zero times x plus f double prime of zero over two factorial times x squared, third derivative over 3 factorial x cubed, fourth derivative over 4 factorial x to the fourth, fifth derivative over 5 factorial x to the fifth, sixth derivative over 6 factorial x to the sixth. All right, now notice Right, so in this pattern here, and, and, and just in the values that we have, um, the first derivative, the third derivative are zero, and the fifth derivative, right? The odd derivatives are zero. So we won't have those terms. And the other ones alternate between positive one and negative one. So this is 1 plus negative 1 over 2 factorial x squared plus 1 over 4 factorial x to the fourth plus negative 1 over 6 factorial x to the sixth. And I think I'll just rewrite that slightly, call it 1 minus 1 half x squared plus 1 over 4 factorial x to the 4th minus 1 over 6 factorial x to the 6th. There is our 6 Maclaurin polynomial for cosine. Um, let's do another one we're going to find the seventh Maclaurin polynomial for sine x. So again, it's Maclaurin, that means c is equal to zero. Um, our function is sine x. So we're going to have a similar pattern of the, the functions that come up, right? So f prime of x is cosine. The second derivative is negative sine. The third derivative is negative cosine. And by the time we get to the fourth derivative, it we're back to sine, right? Back to the beginning. So now we're going to evaluate each of these. So sine of zero is zero. Cosine of zero is one, negative sine of zero is zero, negative cosine zero is negative one. Now we're back to sine, sine of zero is zero. The pattern repeats. So that means that if I take the fifth derivative and evaluate it at zero, I'll be back to 1, and the sixth derivative at 0 is 0, and the seventh derivative at 0 will be negative 1. Now let's set up our seventh Maclaurin polynomial. So here's what it is in general, f of 0 plus f prime of 0 times x, 
f double prime of 0 over 2 factorial x squared, and so on. Okay, now a bunch of these derivatives are 0. This time it's the even one. So the function f of 0 is 0, and then all the even derivatives, the second derivative, the fourth derivative, the sixth derivative, those are all 0. So we just retain the odd terms, and those derivative values alternate between 1 and negative 1. So we have uh, 1 times x, and then this will be minus 1 over 3 factorial x cubed, and then plus 1 over 5 factorial x to the fifth, and minus 1 over 7 factorial x to the seventh. There's our seventh Maclaurin polynomial. So now, just for fun, Uh, let's find the derivative of this polynomial. If I take the derivative of the polynomial we just found, we get just we all we need is the power rule here, so we get one minus uh, three over three factorial x squared plus five over five factorial x to the fourth minus 7 over 7 factorial x to the 6. And if we reduce all these fractions, the 3 cancels with 3 factorial, and we're just left with 1 half. 5 cancels with a factor of 5 and 5 factorial, and we're left with 1 over 4 factorial x to the 4th. 7 cancels with the 7 and the 7 factorial, so we get 1 over 6 factorial x to the 6th. So, you know, take a look at that. Hopefully it looks a little familiar. This is the degree 6 polynomial for cosine. There's something that just feels right about this, that we took the derivative of our Maclaurin polynomial for sine, and we get a Maclaurin polynomial for cosine. That ought to be how it works, you know? Okay, so, you know, we can do this, one of the reasons we do this is to be able to approximate values of a function using, you know, just these algebraic operations like addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, and raising things to powers, um, and raising them to just integer powers like we do with a polynomial. Um, you know, and, and it's not unlike some of the algorithms that are probably in the calculator, like how our calculator knows that that sine of 1.2 radians, which is not one of the convenient values on the unit circle, like one of the ways it can, it can do that uh, is because there's an algorithm that uses something like this to help it, um, you know, kind of pinpoint and zero in within a, a very high degree of accuracy what that approximate value is. So we're going to do uh, an example. We're going to use a fourth Maclaurin polynomial to approximate the value of ln of 1.2. Now, we'll note they're asking for a Maclaurin polynomial, so c is equal to 0. We're going to make a polynomial centered at 0. A couple of things. We can't make a Maclaurin, we don't want to make a Maclaurin polynomial for ln of x because, uh, first of all, ln 0 isn't defined. We can't, we can't center um, a, a polynomial at 0 for ln x. But what we could do is use the function 
f of x equals ln of x plus 1. And that has the added advantage that if I want to approximate the value of ln of 1.1, 1 .1, um, then all I need to do is plug in the value 0 0.1 into my polynomial to approximate that value, and 0 0.1 is relatively close to 0. You get a better approximation the closer you are to the center. So we're going to use this function and then plug in x equals 0 0.1 to approximate ln of 1.1. So there's our function, ln of x, uh, sorry, ln of x plus 1. And f of 0 is equal to ln of 1, which is 0. The first derivative is 1 over x plus 1. f prime of 0 uh, is equal to 1. The second derivative, well, let's see. I'm going to rewrite the first derivative as x plus 1 to the minus 1. So this will be a minus x plus 1 to the minus 2, or negative 1 over x plus 1 squared. And that gives us negative 1. Uh, the third derivative, 2 times x plus 1 to the negative 3. So that's 2 over x plus 1 cubed. Evaluating that at 0 gives us 2. Fourth derivative, negative 6 x plus 1 to the negative 4 or negative 6 over x plus 1 to the fourth. Oops. And then we're going to evaluate our fourth derivative at 0. That is negative 6. All right, and that's as far as we need to go because we want the fourth Maclaurin polynomial. So p4 of x is equal to, our constant term is 0, plus first derivative times x. We're centering it at 0, so we have powers of x, not powers of x minus 1 or x plus 1 or something like that. Um, plus second derivative, negative 1 over 2 factorial x squared, plus third derivative over 3 factorial x cubed, plus fourth derivative over 4 factorial x to the fourth, we can um, simplify this. So I've got x minus 1 half x squared plus 1 third x cubed minus 1 fourth x to the fourth. So there's our um, Maclaurin polynomial. And so what we want to do is we want to evaluate ln of 1.1, and that's going to be approximately equal to p4 of 0 0.1. Um, and that is, uh, well, let's see. We could just sort of plug that in here. I'm going to plug in just our p4 uh, polynomial. So x minus 1 half times x squared plus 1 third times x cubed minus 1 fourth times x to the fourth. And I'm going to evaluate that at point 1. So bars, y bars, function. I get 0 
0953083333. So I wrote out all those digits because now I want to compare it to what my calculator tells me ln of 1.1 is. Just to see how, how uh, close we are. So 0 0.0953101798. So if we just compare, we're accurate to four significant digits, and that's just using a degree four polynomial. When you're using um, a Taylor or Maclaurin polynomial to do approximations, a couple of things to keep in mind um, is that you usually get better approximations uh, when you plug in values that are closer to your center. Right? The farther from the center you stray, um, the further away, the more error you introduce. And then also you get better approximations if you use a higher degree uh, polynomial.